from sitting abroad. We like to say you can discover your destination. UTA Study Abroad offers over 500, actually almost 600 different program options in 62 different countries. You can see just this, um, a sampling of some of our students abroad here. Um, I've listed on there the top five destinations where our students went last year. Spain is always number one for UTA students. It makes perfect sense. We're in Texas. We have a lot of interest in Spanish language and culture. Um, but we, we send lots of students to, to Western Europe as well. We have an increasing interest in students wanting to go to Asia. China, as you see, is on there. We send a lot of students to South Korea. And we have um, seen an increase in students who are wanting to study in Central and South America. So Costa Rica, um, uh, Peru, Chile, Brazil, countries like that. So our hope is that wherever it is that you have always wanted to go, we're going to have a program, if not in that specific city, at least in that country or in that region, so you can check that off your life list. Pick your time abroad. We offer programs almost truly 12 months out of the year. You can choose to study abroad for a few weeks in the summer. You can choose to study abroad for a few weeks during either the fall or spring semesters. Or you can even choose to study abroad for a full academic year. You get to choose about when it's going to work best for you. I do always like to point out here, um, studying abroad is not something that you wake up one day and say, you know what, I think I'm going to go to China, and you buy a ticket and off you go. It doesn't work like that. It takes some planning, it takes some preparation, it usually takes some saving as well. Um, but the point is that you, you need to start thinking um, ahead of time if you're wanting to do some travel abroad. So we have application cycles. Generally speaking, you're going to start the application process about six months before you ever get on a plane. So we're actually just wrapping up our application cycle for students who are wanting to study abroad next semester. And then students who want to study abroad next summer or fall um, will start their application process at the end of this semester. So this kind of gives you a reference when you're mapping out your time here at UTA about when to start planning for study abroad. So in the midst of our 500 plus programs, we have several different program types. Um, we do a lot of advising with students on this and helping them identify. Um, so I'm just going to kind of give you the highlights of these program types. Um, I'm going to start with the faculty-led programs because I'm hoping this might be um, a study abroad model that you're familiar with. Um, and this is where, just as it says, a UTA faculty member takes a group of students abroad. Um, so these are fairly discipline specific. The College of Business actually offers two. One is an undergraduate program um, in Barcelona that goes in the summer that offers um, management and economics courses. And then we have an MBA program um, in management that deals with sustainability issues on the Iberian Peninsula. Um, our second program type is a reciprocal exchange. This is where UTA has partnered directly with foreign universities. And they're reciprocal because we both send students there and receive students to study here. So you maybe have come across an exchange student in one of your courses, and that's one of the great things about reciprocal exchange programs. It allows each institution to have to always have students um, there in their classes here, um, and it gives each student a chance to really experience what life is like as a university student there. Um, we have 22 exchange partners, and I've listed a couple of ones that again um, highlight some of our business courses. Our last program type are our affiliated programs. This actually is the type of program that Emmanuel went on. So instead of partnering directly with the uni one specific university, UTA has partnered with these study abroad organizations, um, such as AIFS or ISA. And by doing so, UTA then has the opportunity to send students on any one of their programs that they work with. That's how we're able to offer so many different program options for our students so that you really have a choice um, and get to build a program that you're most interested in. So you're going to hear from some other folks um, on the panel after me about why you should study abroad and how it's good for you professionally. Um, but I will just say that yes, absolutely studying abroad um, adds valuable experience to your degree that you put into practice after graduation. So a little known fact is that when you take all of the students who graduate from U.S. colleges and universities every year, just about 1% of them have studied abroad. 1%. That's a tiny, tiny percentage when you think about all of the students who are graduating every year. So when you study abroad, and yes, I said when, not if. When you study abroad, when you graduate, you are already setting yourself apart from a lot of other people who are graduating at the same time as you. And that makes you very attractive when you're applying for graduate programs and when you're applying for a real job um, out in the real world. Um, so again, study abroad is not something that just helps you as a UTA student, but helps you after graduation as well. And the last thing that I want to leave you with, if you only remember one thing from my blathering up here for a few minutes today, is that Mavericks can and do study abroad. We send a few hundred students abroad every year, 
That's an okay number for a school of our size, but we're really working hard to increase that. And we want you to know that all of these other students have been able to make it possible for them, and so so can you. There's our contact information for my office as well as for our business students about the um, Mini Fowl Scholarship. I have a whole host of information up here about my office and some different scholarship opportunities. So I do hope you will pick them up um, and then come visit our office and find your way to being a global mapper. Thank you guys so much. While we're, while we're on the subject of cross-cultural influences, I've been told, some of you may know about this uh, better, more, more closely at hand than I do, but in the Japanese culture, they, like, they say they like to take the best from around the world and make it their own. And I'm starting to think that's, uh, that's a, good, a good approach for us to take here at UTA as well. So on cross-cultural dimensions, I think we just saw an example of taking a really good resource for another culture, the, the SMU culture, and making it a part of, of UTA. So thank you, Kelly. We're glad you're here. Okay, our, our next speaker is Cecilia McCormick. In 2001, Cecilia graduated with honors with a master's degree in logistics and transportation management from the Sam Walton College of Business at the University of Arkansas. During her 15-year supply chain management career, Cecilia has worked for global companies like Oakley, Network Global Logistics, All Style Apparel, EPI Worldwide, and some others, serving a wide spectrum of distinguished clients, including Fortune 500 companies like Walmart, Dell, Boeing, and Warner Brothers. Over the years, Cecilia has saved more than $4 million in supply chain annual expense for two of the companies she worked for through supply chain optimization. She's led over 500,000 square foot distribution centers and managed more than 500 warehouse personnel and independent service providers in, around the world. Cecilia is passionate about giving back to the community. In 2004, she became a member of the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals, which we call CSCMP. That's one of the biggest supply chain management professional organizations in the world. She was a membership chair for CSCMP, Southern California's Roundtable, in 2010, and she was secretary for the CSCMP DFW Roundtable for the past year. Two years ago, Cecilia pursued her passion for real estate and became a real estate consultant in Collin County. Currently, Cecilia is one of the most recognized Chinese real estate experts in the DFW area. So please welcome Cecilia McCormick. sitting somewhere similar in Sam Walton Business School and I was like you know um, that was right after I'm from China first and that's right after I arrived from Shenzhen which is half an hour from Hong Kong one of the most developed um, city in China and when I arrived Arkansas uh, Regional Airport the international office picked me up on a pickup I still remember that August 16, very hot in 2000, <laughs> and it's probably 100 degrees. And um, they throw my bag into the pickup, and you know, like shortly after 10 minutes after I jump into the truck, I see like unpaved roads, and I was like, wow, I see more cows than cars. What am I getting myself into? <laughs> and, uh, you know, my program, my program for the, um, my program, I got a full scholarship for a whole year, but I actually finished my program in nine months, and because I want to get out of there, <laughs> to be honest, but, um, you know, it's just, um, it's, it's, it's a great, uh, you know, it's a great experience. Um, um, I'm here to talk about, um, let me see if I can find the presentation. On PowerPoint, it's already opened. Yeah, Cecilia. There we go. And thanks. Cool. So 
um, as Randy had mentioned a little bit, I have worked for eight companies, including working for myself as a supply chain consultant uh, in the first 15 years of my career. And then I've been to 17 countries. Some is for fun, not for work. <laughs> but, um, my dream, actually, my passion is to visit 50 countries before I turn 50. So I'm still, I still have a long way to go. <laughs> but I have enough time, I'm very young. <laughs> <laughs> so I manage 100 plus uh, distribution centers, and we have, we call strategic stocking um, uh, locations. That's where, you know, uh, you put uh, service parts very close to the customer so that they can service a very short uh, service agreement. So like, for telecommunication companies, if if there's a breakdown for the telecommunication communication equipment, they get to be fixed in two hours. And people were frustrated at the first two, 20 minutes, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> the internet is breakdown. So, and um, I've um, managed 500 personnel around the world. Um, Randy already mentioned, uh, save $4 million in annual supply chain budget and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that how do I do that and as one of the key points for you know success for takeaway and these are some of the companies I work for um, um, and work with so um, so I've um, like I said I I'm Chinese and I came here to study for my um, international degree international degree actually is I'm an international student. <laughs> That's first my, my international background. And I came here to study uh, supply chain and transportation management. And back in 2000, well, 1998, um, my first job, actually, I, um, I got hired, um, before I graduated, I got hired as a, a assistant to general manager for one of the biggest, um, back then, a third party uh, logistic company. And um, and I remember we were setting up one of the big warehouse, like a hundred thousand square foot warehouse, um, for um, parking shop uh, in southern China in 28 cities. And we are we are building the warehouse from ground zero, and we're hiring a hundred uh, warehouse employees. And one of my job is to lead groups to to tour this one of their state of the art, one of the first. Uh, distribution center in China, modernized. And then I was, you know, really looking through the dictionary and to think how to translate logistic, you know? It's, it's, not, it's not a word that's as predominant as today. And then after I said what logistic is, in Chinese means wu liu, right? So the movement of products. And then I have to, again, explain in Chinese in a sentence. Logistic basically means, you know, how to move product around the world at the at the best cost with the shortest time <laughs> you know with the you know with the uh, quality of service you would you would want so that's what logistic means so logistic really doesn't exist back then in China but that's what led me to um, to this industry <laughs> back then is, is you know not as well known but I find I'm really fascinated you know how people can use different different ways to to manage products so efficiently and um, and then that's why I came to the University of Arkansas to study uh, for my degree. And that's I think that's how people you know succeed uh, because just pursue your passion. Life is so short, and if you're not if you're doing something that you hate, uh, you may as well get out of there, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you know you pretty soon you're going to face your career choice. You know what you're going to do in life. And um, there's so many choices, even in supply chain. You know, there's so many different sectors, all the way from manufacturing origin point. You know, manufacturing, the transportation, the distribution, and the you know inventory management, the fulfillment, and customer service. You know, all the fulfillment, um, the last mile delivery. You know, UPS, FedEx, expedited delivery. So many things you can choose from. So you can always, you know. Just uh, choose something you love to do, and also I think one of the things that set me apart is that I have a very positive mindset. You know, you go into a job, you're new, and you're worried, and you're like, you know, am I going to earn my time here? Am I going to make contribution to this company? 
and are they going to listen to me, and all those nonsense in your head, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, just be there and knowing that you are there because, because you have the qualifications, you have the education, and you don't know anything, which is a good thing, you know? That's one of the things how I save, you know, $4 million dollars um, um, in a annual span is by asking questions, by, you know, not coming and thinking this is the way things should, that should be done because it has been done this way. So my job is to go into each operation and look at how to improve, what's the best way to do things. So I always, always go in, learn the process with a mindset, I'm going to find a better way to do it. <laughs> the current way is not the best way, or it's not necessarily the best way, usually. So, um, so you go in with a positive mindset, I'm a contribution and I'm going to make a difference here. And this is something I love to do, and I have the knowledge, and I don't have all the old thinking that would prevent me from doing a great job, right? <laughs> so go in with a positive mindset and <coughs> ask questions. Like, when I go to the operation now, I always ask, why do we do things this way? And in all style apparel, this is one of the biggest t-shirt manufacturers in North America. They sell to uh, printers like Quicksilver, Oakley, you know, Nike, you name it. So they have, um, they're shipping yarn, you know, in North Carolina to Anaheim, their, their headquarters, like five to seven trucks of 50 free trailers every day. So they ship like five to seven trucks on the Teamster truck, you know, three days turn, we ship here every day. And then I go in as, uh, I'm responsible for transportation and distribution. And so I said, okay, why do we do that? They said, well, it has been done like for the last 21 years. Why not? <laughs> I was like, okay. But, um, you know, I think we can do it cheaper. They said, how? I was like, we can put it in, into model, you know? We can put this thing because we manage the ordering process all the way from origin <laughs> to distribution. We can order ahead of time. We can put it on, on truck, you know? It's going to take nine days. There's like nine days. <laughs> it's going to, you know, we have million dollars operation every day. If we are late, we're going to ruin the whole thing. I said, no, you, you, we, we can plan. That's what we are paid to do. We can plan better. We can plan the lead time for nine days. Or you can plan the days for 10 days, you know? You just need to, let's try it. You know, let's give it a try. Let's, if we put it on the rail, it's going to save us, you know, 30% of our transportation costs. <laughs> And then, you know, I finally persuaded the, the head of uh, manufacturing to give it a try. Of course, you know, the first try we did, we, we, we contract with one of the biggest companies, JB Hunt, and they flipped the two, two loads on the way to here, uh. and, you know, it's, all the shipment was ruined. They're, they're like, yeah, that's a good try. <laughs> <laughs> and then Katrina happened, so the lead time gets longer oh. on the rail. But anyway, after all those hassles, um, my plan was to put 80% of our inventory on the rail, and they end up saying, you know, can we put 100%? We love it so much. <laughs> can we do that? I was, I was like, no, I want to save 20% for emergency, you know? But anyway, so we, we put it in the, in the rail, and that saved us, um, that cut our transportation span from $3,000 per truck to like $15,000 per truck. And so that just alone saved us 1.5 million in our shipping overall. And that actually improved the uh, efficiency for us to do things as well. Because when you sit on the you know, railway station, it act uh, like an interim <coughs> stock room for the, for the operation guy. They can pick and choose. I want to unload this truck first, versus if there's a Teamster right by your door, you have to unload right away because they're going to head back to North Carolina the minute you finish unloading. So that take a lot of stress and you know take out lots of the unnecessary firefighting in the warehouse. So all of this is start by asking the simple and seemingly stupid question: Why do we do things this way? You know, and um, and the other thing I think that students is just I think I'm I'm you know lifetime students. I love to learn and that's. One of the things that I think always going to add value to every operation, <laughs> any operation. So always keep learning and you know learn from everyone. In Chinese, we have a saying: in free people, there's always someone you can learn from, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So 
from the warehouse person, I'm trying to learn why they do things this way, you know? And they have a, they're the first level of contact with your products and sometimes with, um, they find things, they do things intuitively and might be the right way to do things, you know? You can learn from them, you can learn from everyone. And, um, and be a contribution, knowing that, you know, you can be a contribution, even if you're new and even you might not know the process or know a lot, you can still be a contribution. You know, one of your biggest contributions is your time. You can spend time, learn the process, and come up with something that you can make a difference with. Um, my international background, besides I'm Chinese from China, <laughs> um, I did study abroad when I was uh, in my short nine months in Sam Walton College. I went on the NAFTA trip. So I went on to visit Mexico, Washington DC, and uh, Canada. And with, um, with the business school, um, Sam Walton, they have one of the top five logistic programs because they are, you know, endorsed by the Sam Walton family, you know, Walmart and Sam's Club. <laughs> so we have a great opportunity to actually work directly with the Sam Walton stores, you know, uh, the, the Walmarts, and study, roll out lots of the programs before they hit, you know, all the region. We do the neighborhood program, we see the layout of the stores and how, how we should flow the goods, how do we, you know, market the goods, all those things the students can work with. So that's a great program to, to have. Um, I have been to lots of countries and I work with international teams. And it's great that, you know, you, myself, I'm from, I have an international background, but you don't have to be a foreigner to, to really appreciate or, you know, to, to understand, you know, people, people are different in, in, in how they do things, but people like the same thing, you know, they like to be appreciated, they, have, they like to contribute, they want to, you know, they want to say their opinion. They want to think they matter. You know, they want to be rewarded for doing the right thing and stuff. So that's, you know, it, that's universal. So you come in with an open mindset that knowing that people do things differently, you're going to appreciate the culture difference. You're going to, you know, know the time difference and the currency difference. Some of the, you know, values and, you know, uh, mindset are different, but Eventually, people want to have a stable job, a, a great environment that you know that nourish, nourish leadership and nourish you know innovation and good practices. So those are all, all the same. So you know uh, we don't have to be an international.